Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Women Today. Fast and my good afternoon. It's six minutes past two, and for the next hour, you are very welcome to join myself and my studio guest on the Conister Rock. We're going to be sharing music and memories of what is certainly a very interesting life so far, and I think we're in for some fun this afternoon because I am delighted to be joined by an officer of the British Empire, no less, a man who began his working life uh, before the age of 10, delivering the news to his Castletown neighbours on a humble paper round, only in later years to become the news as a result of his extensive political career, finding himself on front page headlines of those very newspapers he once delivered, first becoming a Castletown commissioner then chairman of said commissioners, then a minister, then speaker of the House of Keys and eventually chief minister of his island home and nature nation. Tony Brown, OBE, uh, did you ever dream as a boy when you were uh, delivering those papers that you'd so regularly be featured in them in the future? Hi, Christy. No, I didn't. Um, as a young boy, I had no sort of vision of politics at all. Um, and certainly life was different back in those days when I was a young lad. And, uh, you know, a person like me ever getting into that sort of area was something you would never even dream of. So do you find yourself sort of looking back and thinking you're quite proud of yourself now? Yeah, um, <laughs> without saying too much, yes, of course I am. Um, well, we'll find out more about all of your, your achievements over the course of the next hour. But I wonder now, how much of your time do you uh, dedicate to sort of keeping up with local politics? And do you spend any of your time at all thinking... Oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty natural that you'd think that way uh, after 35 years in politics, so I don't think you can avoid that. Um, of course, I am continue to be interested in the town, the people of the town, and the island generally, and what, what it's doing, where it's going, what's happening. Um, but I try not to, and it's very difficult, I try not to get too drawn into issues. Uh, I have been, on a couple of occasions, drawn into issues which I think are really very important, and I've therefore... Um, made public comment on those but the, I think there's two over a period of seven years isn't bad. And what were those? One was to do with the prescriptions and the changes that were being proposed um, some time ago which I felt were quite draconian and I made that point in my submission um, and the other one was to do with um, planning in relation to development in Castletown Square um, and others oh, three and the third one is about the Castletown Police Station. Mm -hmm. And I got involved in that because I think it's an opportunity we can't afford to miss with it being an integral part of the history of the town. And quite different to a normal police station because of its history and what, how it was built, what it did and how it plays a part in really what is the complete picture of the castle and the old house of keys and so on. So uh, those were the ones that I've generally publicly got involved in. And it clearly, you know, just listening to you now, and we will talk about this later, very much a proud, uh, is it Castletonian? Castletonian? Castletonian, yeah. Castletonian? Yeah, I would think so. Do you think, do you think Depends you, who you, you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think you could have ever found yourself living anywhere else on the island? No. I mean, Castletown, and it's easy for somebody like me to say, is quite unique. I mean, there's people from all over, over the island who will say their area is quite unique. But I think, you know, growing up as I did, being involved with people, starting out as a, uh, a boy delivering papers when I was nine years old and uh, being involved in working in the town and the south of the island, then having a business and then developing into politics. I think the whole thing just gives you a strong feeling for the area you live in. And, you know, I've always been very interested in Castletown, its history, even when I was younger, uh, when most times you actually don't take that much note to see your history. Um, but I remember getting very involved and uh, I remember interviewing um, the custodian of the castle, um, Norman Gale, um, and uh, doing a piece on the last man to be hanged in the Isle of Man. And I think that helped also, this is when I was at Castle Russian High School, helped sort of uh, develop my interest in the history of the town and the history of Castle Town generally. So. And, and what a history the town has as well. And, you know, I should stay, say as well, very proud to have grown up in Castletown mm. myself. And it was a great place to grow up. So let's go back then to little Tony Brown, little, <laughs> little James Anthony Brown, we should say. Uh, so you, what were some of your absolute favourite things to do as a child? Because I think um, looking at your notes, bicycle seemed to play quite an important part in your childhood. Well, it did. Um, but that was because Castletown's on the level. Um, I hated going to Port Aaron on the push bike because we had Fisher's Hill to climb both ways. And if you got into Port Erin, it was nothing but hills. So I I was not really a fan of going to Port Erin like the rest of the gang. 
Um, but uh, I'm a pretty lazy bike rider, really. If it's not flat and level or downhill only, then I'm not that interested, really. And it was the same when I was young. Um, but I, th- I think the main thing is that uh, as a young child living in Castletown, we were very lucky and st- children of today I think are still very lucky um, because we had Langness uh, to go and play out on Langness headland, we had Scarlet we had the beaches um, we had um, up the river which was one of our favourite places to go and we'd spend in school holidays you know, day after day after day playing up the river, um, doing all sorts of things, making things out of clay that used to be there, wouldn't last very long because we couldn't uh, heat them up so that they would survive but it was still part of the fun so we were very fortunate in that way in the sort of 1950s, early 60s. Um, we were much freer than children are today, and I think people forget that sometimes. We had so much freedom. People didn't pester us the same. Um, there was no health and safety. If you wanted to go and enjoy yourself, you could, and you weren't pestered because you might hurt yourself. If you hurt yourself, you got up and, you know, just got going again. So, uh, unfortunately, in our time, somebody wasn't that lucky, but most times people were, and we grew, we had the opportunity as children to grow up in not just a town, but a, a country environment which surrounded that town. And I think that was fantastic. And does it then, on that note, frustrate you now when there are an awful lot of kids now who do sort of spend a lot of their time looking down at a mobile phone and not actually appreciating that outside countryside? Does, does that frustrate you at all? Well, in, not really. I, I mean, I think the difference is that we went out and played in the countryside because there was nothing else to do. I mean, we, we were in gangs because there was nothing else to do. We had no TV. Nobody had a telly, or not until the early 60s. So, you know, there wasn't really much else to do. So we would, if anything, we were told off at night for hanging around the streets, but actually there wasn't anything else to do. We used to play football when I lived in Janet's Corner. They used to close the road off the kids on a Sunday morning, and there'd be football, and everybody would play football. And when the milk float came, the game would stop while he went through, and he never complained, and then the game would start again. The streets were a lot of where we used to play, uh, you can't do that now because there's too many cars, there's too many restrictions. Um, people are a little bit more intolerant, I think, and sometimes forget just how it was for them when they were children, how much freedom they did have. And uh, I think that children are not much different than we were, except they're more restricted. And I think that the electronic age has taken over uh, very much influenced their lifestyle. And uh, how you'll ever break that down, I really don't know, because it is fascinating. Um, I've got three uh, grandchildren, two of which who are now th- three years old area, just coming up to three, the other one. And, uh, you know, they already know how to use an iPad. They know how to turn things on, t- to find things on it. I mean, that's at two and three year olds. And I mean, they're going to develop those skills further and further as they get older. And we won't understand that. I mean, it will be so strange for us. And I think it's a matter of how do parents encourage their children then at some times to maybe leave those things at home and go out and play. But parents, to some degree, are a bit scared about that now because they're worried about so much traffic on the road, how safe are the children going to be crossing the road. So there's lots of things playing on how now I think children are developing. What a contrast between that idea of the fast traffic on the roads now and you sort of patiently waiting for a milk truck to go through at five miles an hour while you stopped your football game. Well, one, one, of, one of the things we used to do at Janet's Corner was sit on the uh, wall there where the entrance gate was, which is Douglas, um, Douglas Street, uh, sorry, Douglas Road. And we used to do car spotting, the latest numbers. And you'd sit there sometimes for 20 minutes and no car would go past. Wow. And then another car would come and you'd all you'd all be sat there all over you, jotting down the numbers. And then when it was all finished, you'd all compare who's got the latest car number to see who, who'd who found the latest car that had been registered in the Isle of Man. So you couldn't do that now. You couldn't Very keep up with the amount time. of cars going past. So different times you it's know. true and you know we talk about the fact that first of all lack of cars also you no know, television that sort of thing you did come from very humble beginnings didn't you because i love that on your notes you said that uh, you thought you pretty much reached the heights of luxury when you got your first inside loo yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah well fr- from my early life we lived in mill street which has now been redeveloped which i was proud to play a part in um, we lived in Mill Street and uh, they were commissioners' houses at that time. And of course, Janet's Corner was in the parish of Maloo. It wasn't in Castletown. The boundary hadn't been extended. And I can remember when I was seven years old, we uh, we moved up to Janet's Corner because of the condition of the old commissioner's house. And we were transferred to a local government board house, as it was in those days. And I can remember it very, very well walking no cars in those days, walking up to Janet's Corner, which seemed forever, seemed miles away, out the sticks, and uh, walking through the gates, which were the pillars uh, going into there, and there was a row of trees in those days and a grass verge, 
And uh, I can always remember just being absolutely mesmerised, never seen it before because it was too far away to go and play at seven. And just absolutely shocked at how wonderful this place looked, all these massive big houses, big wide roads, grass verges. And then, of course, we got to our new house, which was in Bromit Road, number 26, and uh, went in and, wow, there's a bath. Oh, <laughs> there's a toilet. It was just amazing because we'd always had a tin bath in Mill Street. There were no inside facilities, outside toilet. I mean, this is only 1957. This sounds terrible. But, you know, life was pretty tough and there were very limited facilities. And at that time, the then Janet's Corner was only 10 years old. So the place was immaculate. You know, it's now been rebuilt. And I think what's there now, it's absolutely fabulous mm -hmm. the way it's been laid out, uh, creating individual areas. And, of course, importantly, the quality of uh, housing that people now live in. And uh, we mentioned at the start that um, you, you also started work very young. I think you were nine, were you, nine, when you first yeah. had your paper round? And I wonder if that also sort of gave you a certain sense of community because, of course, you, you were sort of getting out and around the neighbourhood. You would have presumably been meeting people as you delivered the newspapers to them, current affairs of the day. Did that sort of uh, sort of spark anything off in you, do you think? Well, I think it may well have done. I mean, not consciously. Um, I used to be terrible for reading the papers before I delivered them through the letterbox. So I'd be walking down the street. I mean, most houses were next to each other but some of them had gardens so there was a little bit of a gap and you know it might take me 10 houses to read the front page of the daily mail you know and i'd be reading the stories but not really consciously necessarily absorbing it that it would influence me it was just you know it was better reading the paper and walking than just walking so uh, that's what i used to do so and I, and again i met people i was involved with people i used to work in the paper shop uh, on the saturday mornings or saturday afternoons out of choice because i wanted to just do something really because there was often times when you had nothing to do and because i worked there i did that i also did a, a grocery delivery on a push bike so i'd finish my paper round and go and do that so i was meeting people all the time and they're always the people of castletown and even when i started work uh, with the Alaman Electricity Board as an apprentice. Of course, I was working in and out of houses in the whole of the South, including Castletown. So I was always involved with people. And from that, maybe I learned skills that I was able to use in my later life. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like it would be a good start, certainly, for what came in the future. Oh, Tony Brown's left his telephone on. <laughs> I know. Hang on, I'll just see. Oh, somebody complained. No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you work out I how to switch off. your phone off, let's hear what your first piece of music is then, Tony. Right, well, the first piece of music, because I haven't touched on this, is uh, goes back to the days of what we set up was called the 7.30 Disco. And there's many people across the island who still have fond memories of it. It was started in uh, December 69 and developed really in 1970-71. It was a group of us, 18, 19 year olds. There was nothing to do. We set it up ourselves in what is now St Mary's on the Harbour. And uh, we used to have about 300 uh, young people every Saturday night in there. And this was, uh, as I say, back in the 70s. So all that music was um, important to us. And, you know, we lived it. As, as the organisers, we lived the disco. That was our life. And um, I always think this piece of music actually helps demonstrate the change. You know, something in the air, we were changing, life was changing. We were doing things we'd never dreamt of doing before. But I think society generally in the 70s was changing. And uh, this music to me reflects that change. And I think that's something that sort of reminds me of what we did. <laughs>
choice first piece of music chosen by my Conister Rocks guest this afternoon, Tony Brown. And uh, Tony, the reason you chose that uh, was because it actually played a part in you starting your political career. That and a motorbike crash. I think that's the most unusual <laughs> collection of things to, to incite someone to get into politics. How on earth? Well, it, it was basically I'd um, been involved with the 730 Disco and we had a lady who helped make sure we could carry on called Mrs. Tatton, Margaret Tatton, which some people may well uh, know her. Um, she passed away many years ago now and she was fantastic. She supported us because we were only young teenagers um, and uh, the church was allowing us to use the room and we had a bit of a problem and she stepped in as the adult and said, I'll support you. And, and she taught us an awful lot how to run the disco, how to manage it on a proper committee basis, how to look after the money we raised. And it was all voluntary, but we needed to make it all work. And uh, we were all inexperienced kids, you know, um, teenagers. And so that really helped us move on. Um, in When I was about 20, 21, my, uh, Mrs. Tatton used to always say to me, you should stand for the commissioners. You know, you should stand for the commissioners. I say, no, no, it's full of old people. I'm far too young. Why would I go into that? And, uh, of course, I never did um, initially. Uh, anyway, in 1976, um, I'd had motorbikes from 1973 onwards, as in big bikes. And in 1976, I uh, was hit by a vehicle um, up by the Whitestone Garage and ended up in hospital, quite seriously injured at the time. And I was convalescing afterwards and the elections came up for the commissioners. And of course, all my mates saying when we sat there in the square, I remember very clearly, why don't you stand? Why don't you stand? And I said, no, no, I'm, you know, I'm too young. I was 26 then, too young. And one of them said, I'm going to get you a form. And off we went and got a form to come on, put your name down on here. And I said, no, no, I'm far too young. Let's go and see me dad. And that was Harry Coburn, who I used to work with. And um, Ian Coburn took me to see his dad and... Harry said to me, of course you should stand. He said, you know, you're just what we need, a young person like you. So I was persuaded then to sign the form and they went out and got the assenters. And uh, I, I um, at that time, and just prior to, yes, at that time then, I, I signed the form, got it all in, um, stood for election, got the highest turnout the Castletown had ever seen, 64% of voters came out and I got the highest vote that had ever been in Castletown. Um, so I was more shocked, I think, than most people um, that I got such a vote. But of course, you know, I was working in the town. People knew me. People even knew me from wearing short pants, from being the cheeky little kid who delivered <laughs> the papers um, and, and all these things together and the disco and everything. And don't forget it. Well, you might not know at that time I had long hair, which was, I think, a bit longer than yours. Um, oh, that's and, something. <laughs> and very jet black um, because, you know, the barbers didn't make much money out of me. I mean, maybe once every two years I went and had it trimmed. Um, so Too you know, scruffy to be a commissioner, Tony. <laughs> well, absolutely. And I was a bit heavier then, dare I say, than I, <laughs> I am even now. I used to like lots of chips and things. Anyway, um, and I, I went into politics. I found when I was a commissioner, I was enjoying it. I enjoyed being involved with people. I cared about the town, naturally. I wanted to see things change and happen, but change in a good way that I hoped would benefit people. And I was also very, very fortunate because local authorities then had a lot more um, responsibilities than they do today. Um, I was very fortunate that I had really good colleagues there who helped me along. John Atkinson, uh, John Quinney, Fred Beagle, uh, and, and they were really good at, and Cliffy Peach at teaching me how things worked, not trying to stop me, but trying to encourage me, but saying, this is how you have to do it if you want to do it that way. So I got a lot of skill off them of, of how to be a politician, if you like. And of course, when the next election came up, which was 1979, because you were in for three years in those days, I said, if I get reelected to this, I'm going to stand for the keys in 1981. And that's what happened. And the rest, they could say, is history. Well, we'll be finding out much more about that history over the course of the next hour. So if you have any messages for Tony Brown, you can text one double six one double seven or email studio at manxradio.com. We'll be back with more music and memories after the break. Doing the things you love is easy, right? Not if you have dementia. Alzheimer's Society needs young volunteers for its side-by-side -side scheme so people with dementia can keep enjoying the things they love. Whatever activities you like, Alzheimer's Society will match you to a person with the same interests so you can give them a chance to get more out of life. Side-by-side -side with you. Side-by-side -side volunteering. Find out more. Call 613 181. Message sponsored by Selton Manx. Investing in our community. Hear this? <sighs> 
That's the sound of relaxing, knowing you've bought your new car from I Am One Car Centre. A used car bought on the island, but at UK price, from a family business with 25 years in the motor trade and the most highly reviewed garage on the island, with over 200 reviews on the I Am One Car Centre Facebook page. See for yourself, follow our Facebook page, or visit us at I Am One Car Centre in the heart of Douglas on Domain Road. Call 611 040. For mouth-watering meals in a relaxed, comfortable environment, visit Ocean Restaurant. Situated on the beautiful North Quay, Douglas, you'll be spoiled for choice with our delicious seasonal menu, including fresh fish and local specialities. At Ocean Restaurant, you can experience an amazing lunch, weekend brunch, or intimate dinner. For more information or to book, visit oceanrestaurant.im or call 622 Ocean Restaurant. Exquisite coastal dining. I found the man. I've chosen the dress. Now I just need a new kitchen that suits. Visit the Granite Center in Laxey, whether you're a commoner like me or a real blue blood like him. Then install your complete kitchen, from appliances and the latest boiling water taps to a fantastic range of natural worktops. Say I do to the Granite Center on 612287. Kitchens and worktops from granitecenter.im. A right royal marriage. It's time to invest in renewable energy with Manx Solar Electrical, the experts in heat pumps, wind and solar energy, and the island's official Tesla Powerwall certified installer. Choose the island's leaders in renewables. Call 665 800 or visit manxsolarelectrical.com. Come to Manx Solar Electrical when you want the best. Call Absolute. Free quote, call Absolute Scaffolding now on 620505. Absolute Scaffolding. Big enough to cope, small enough to care. Women today. It is just coming up to 29 minutes past two and we are on the Conister Rock this afternoon with Tony Brown. And I've just had a message for you, Tony. It's a lovely message that's just come in. Uh, Please tell Tony, thank you, that's in capitals, from me. He was one of my referees when I was joining the Royal Air Force in 1996. He hardly knew me, but agreed. I served for 12 years and never forgot this small kindness that made such a difference. That is from James Quinney. What a lovely message. Yeah, well, thank you, James. And yes, I mean, it's nice to have somebody who remembers I mean, dare say back that far, 1996. <laughs> and in fact, I, I just mentioned before, I think it's his great granddad, who was John Quinney. And, uh, you know, so it's quite interesting then that uh, James' message came up as well. So How lovely I was great. That... That's that's part of what we were about is to help as much as we could encourage and support young people uh, trying to do what they wanted to do. And I'm glad it all worked out well for James. And speaking of those times and young people, I should remind people, there are some photos that you can, <laughs> if you go over to the Manx Radio Facebook or uh, in, in modern times, we have Instagram as well, you know, and Twitter. Uh, there are some fabulous photos that, that Tony sent us and uh, you can see photos of that very disco club and uh, you and your hat and interesting fashions and things. Absolutely. And yeah, and uh, right up to today as well. So well worth a look. But we're talking about when you first got into politics as mm. such, talking about the commissioners and then leading into being a minister, of course. I wonder, did your parents um, encourage you at all? And did they have any sort of interest in politics themselves? No, there was no politics in our house at all. I mean, nobody ever talked about politics. But what my mother used to do, of course, was help other people. So I got the spin-off, I think, of being involved with helping other people and being involved with people. And I'm a firm believer that if anybody can go into politics if they're able to get the support... But you've got to go in for the right reason. And one of the main, main reasons has to be because you care about society. You want to improve people's quality of life. You want to help them. You want to encourage people to do better and provide opportunities. And without that, then I don't think you're necessarily a good politician. Um, Yes, you have to make difficult decisions. Yes, you have to make decisions that sometimes people don't understand. Um, But very importantly, 
the responsibility of the politician is to explain to people why you made that decision. And if you're able to expand and explain why you got to where you had to be, in your opinion, and it's all about, because it's representative uh, democracy, um, then, you know, quite a few people will understand that then. The biggest problem is when people don't understand why you're doing things. Why have you made that decision? And if their frustration gets too much, then eventually it becomes a problem. Um, and I also felt, you know, I, I'm a cast town lad. Um, I just carried on living in town, albeit with all my responsibilities, whatever area I was in at the time, just being Tony Brown. You know, I accepted and I acknowledged that I had uh, responsibilities in public life. Um, and I was fortunate that my wife and children have, were very supportive and the children especially had to grow up in an atmosphere that was slightly different than most families, not massively over here, but slightly different. Um, but we still just got on with life. You know, I still wanted to be Tony Brown who lived in Castletown, but accepted I had responsibilities at senior level in government and, and had to make sometimes very difficult decisions. And also, I'm assuming, I had to then deal with the impact it would have on yourself and your family because you went from being, you know, sort of Tony, the, the shop owner, Tony, the guy who delivered the papers, whatever, from all that time to then, oh, we can stop him and talk to him and ask him things. Did people treat you differently? And did you, did you find like it did have a massive impact on yourself and your family life? Uh, I don't think people did. I mean, I always found people in Castletown, by the main, I mean, generally, there's always an odd one that was a bit uh, excited, but by the main, um, were very supportive. And even if they didn't vote for you or didn't necessarily agree with you, I always found that they were courteous. They wanted to know why you'd done something. They would express their opinion. And in fact, I used to encourage people to let me know. I wanted to know what they thought because that helped me understand what people wanted. If I don't understand people, I don't understand how we all live, how can I make decisions that affect how we live? Um, so to me, that was critically important. Hence why we still used to go out to the pubs um, as normal. Um, whether I was speaker, whether I was chief minister or a minister, we'd still go down to the local pub and have a drink and enjoy ourselves. Uh, and yes, I was conscious that I had to, within reason, behave myself because I had... I was holding those senior positions for the Isle of Man, um, not just for, you know, Tony Brown doing it, but it was for the Isle of Man. And uh, whilst enjoying myself, to some degree, behaving myself, because that's what's expected. Um, but I hopefully never falsely tried to be something I'm not. I always tried to keep myself down to earth. Um, and some of the greatest compliments I used to get from people is, you never change. And no, as far as I was concerned, I never changed. I'm still as mischievous as ever. I still like to have a good time, but I will do, and when I was in those positions, I will do my job to the uh, requirement that's needed to ensure the island was secure. And, and how did you take, how did you find having to represent the Isle of Man on sort of the world stage? Did you take to that quite easily? Well, I don't know about easily, but I mean, what I did find out very quickly, and especially when I was chief minister, was at the end of the day, the person I was talking to, the minister from across or the Secretary of State was they were still just a person and they had their job to do and I had my job to do and uh, my view was in representing the island I would put the best case forward we could and try and ensure that I could safeguard the island's interests and we used to have some uh, we had discussions in Washington we had discussions in Brussels uh, with senior officials as well as with politicians and my job was clearly to represent the island man to the best uh, ability I could and one of the things to make enable me to do that was to read my papers, ensure that I understood the, the basis of what we were trying to do, and, of course, remember um, what I was doing because you couldn't have your papers necessarily sat in front of you while you, you can't just suddenly read something. You have to speak it because it's actually what you genuinely believe. And if you don't do that, they can pick that up very quickly. Um, so I was fortunate because I had very good officers behind me who gave me the advice and support, but very clearly the decisions were ones that I felt were the right ones um, that I felt we had to take forward. And we were very successful in lots of the areas we dealt with. Uh, one or two we struggled um, because there was always this argument, you know, you're just the Isle of Man, yes, but, you know, we might not be a sovereign state, but we're not part of the United Kingdom. We're actually, we have our own government, our own parliament, and we're trying to do the best for us. We're responsible, but we still have the right to be able to do the best for the Isle of Man and that was really what it was about. Tony Brown, what is your next piece of music and why have you chosen it? Well, the next bit of music is um, one from uh, Smetna, which is um, about the uh, Blue Danube running down through the 10 countries from 
um, from Germany down through Prague and out into the Black Sea. Um, and this is one that I, I've sort of been very keen on since I was at school when our music teacher called Harry Pickard, which many people will remember Harry, um, he introduced us to this when we were actually having the International Med Festival of Music and Dance, which was a major event in the uh, in the island and based in Castletown. And Harry had uh, amazing talent, and again followed by his son uh, Alan Pickard, and uh, they were able to do things that at that time nobody could do. They were able to get permission for Russian singers and dancers. This is at the height of the Cold War to be able to come to the Isle of Man to entertain. They were able to get people from Czech, Czechoslovakia, as it was then called, from Romania, all these countries uh, who were behind the Iron Curtain, to use the term, because of music and because of people's respect for Harry and then subsequently for Alan when Harry passed on, um, were able to come to the Isle of Man to provide fantastic festivals of music and dancing right around the island. And this was one called, uh, and if I get it right, Voltfa, and I hope that's right. And uh, this music to me is, is fantastic. Harry Pickard, I always remember when I was at school, telling us what it was doing, how the river was flowing carefully down through all these 10 countries, and then it got excited as it came into Prague, and you can hear it in the music. I know we have a limited time for it because it's actually quite a lengthy piece of music, um, but it's a fabulous piece of music, and I hope people enjoy it. fabulous piece of music I should say uh, as chosen by Tony Brown that is uh, Voltava from Marvlast and uh, I should say Tony that you mentioned Harry Pickard there uh, his son Alan Pickard that you also mentioned also introduced that piece of music to me so I think it was something <laughs> that was obviously part of the family which Absolutely. is fantastic and you mentioned him as, as something of an inspiration uh, someone else that you mentioned inspired you uh, was the uh, very first president of Tim Walter Charles Carouche and he's someone who he very much fought for political reform didn't he and, and he had very much fought for what was described as Manx self-determination and I wonder as he is someone that very much inspired you uh, how important those kinds of values are to you as well. Oh absolutely I mean Sir Charles was um, fabulous in terms of how he would put over his argument how he would wind it up how he would instigate people uh, and encourage people to have their say he was very supportive of me when I was a member I mean I was 31 when I got in the keys at the time there weren't many people who got in at that age. And he was really very kind and very supportive um, of me trying to do what I do. And I think the important thing is that he, he his determination um, to protect the island, um, to take it forward. And in fact, Max Radio wouldn't be here only for Sir Charles and 
some of his colleagues fighting the British government back in those days. I mean, people forget, you know, we had very little say in what we wanted to do back at that time. And he fought and fought and kept going down to London to get the right to have a radio station and not only have a radio station, but have a commercial one, which was unheard of. Um, by the British government who, remember, closed down Radio Caroline and all these commercial radio stations. And, you know, that sort of um, persistence, focus and understanding of what he wanted to do was something that I think I benefited from, from hearing him debate in the key, well, not in the keys because he was speaking, but in Tinwald, um, how he would put together his arguments, how he would really be quite strong when it was necessary and I hope I picked up some of those uh, sort of um, skills from him. I certainly learned a lot from him and his firmness on sustaining and identifying our Manx culture, our unique heritage, the Viking heritage, our Celtic heritage, everything was really very strong. And uh, I, I think that to some degree in recent years we've actually let that drift. And I do think we need to sort of focus far more on that. Um, to try and encourage people, our own people, to understand what our heritage is about. Um, and not just the heritage as in the built heritage, the castles and the things like that which are important, but also the heritage we have that is unique in terms of the Viking heritage. Tinwald comes from the Vikings. We all recognise Tinwald Hill, but there's very little apart from the House of Manannan which tells us about the history of the Vikings in the Isle of Man. And Sir Charles was very, very strong in making sure that at every opportunity he emphasised uh, that difference of the Isle of Man, why it's not part of the United Kingdom, why it is different, why the Isle of Man uh, is unique, and of course protecting what we call Manxness. And I think we need to do more to do that really. We have an identity, let's be proud of it. I should ask you then, uh, something that Stu's been talking about on his show today, there's been a brand new film released uh, to, to promote the Isle of Man. Uh, I managed to show you a little bit mm. of it before we came on air. It feels like that does represent some of what you're talking about. Yes, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it's the uniqueness. It, you know, we can't compete with lots of the British um, resorts because those days have gone. They went a long time ago. They went 30 years ago. Uh, and we, we don't pretend that we can. What we can do, though, is compete because, one, we're an island which has a slightly different nature than if you are in mainland UK. Um, we have a lot of history that is unique. Um, a lot of our history is developed because we had our own parliament and our own government, albeit back in the day headed up by the governor, but still retaining that uniqueness. And the island's countryside is magnificent. The place is not chock-a-block with cars and, and people. And there's a lot for people to see that's different. But we do desperately need investment in some of our infrastructure to make it even more attractive, um, to give people an experience which is unique. It is unique, the Isle of Man, in that way. And, and I have to say, you know, if you go to Jersey or Guernsey, their heritage is unique and they attract people because of it. And we can do the same. So, you know, our big thing is all around is Scotland, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, England, Wales are investing tens of millions of pounds in their heritage and tourism culture. We're not. And we're not even spending equivalent to what they're spending. We sometimes identify the money, but we actually don't invest it. And I think we need to really get to grips with investing. Again, we had a spurt of it um, 20 years ago. We need to have another spurt to bring us forward again. And we have so much here that really can attract families, and people with different interests, and it's absolutely fabulous. Horse trams, electric trams, steam trains, they are needing major investment to keep them sustainable and to keep them attractive. And again, dare I say, you know, have people dressed in a way that reflects the history of those unique railways and the horse trams, not just in modern-day uniforms with maybe bright yellow day glow jackets on. I think, you know, we need to be a little bit more conscious and careful how we actually invest and how we make these things work. Passionate words from Tony Brown, our guest this afternoon on the Conister Rock. Let's hear a little bit of your next track and then we'll get the ad break out of the way, Tony. What's your next track? Oh, sorry. I, was, I thought you were just going to <laughs> stay into the music then. You were just on your world I, stage I, I, there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the next track is Bright Eyes, um, which, of course, was uh, what 
a record at the top of its time at the time when I got married or thereabouts and it was really I think a fabulous piece of music the story of course is is uh, one that many people will know um, but for me memories that this was the first dance I had with my wife when we got married in the days when we were at the Bellevue that's where we had our reception in Port M the Bellevue Hotel sadly now gone um, and this was the piece of music that reminds me and which I enjoy of our first dance Floating out of the time Following the river of death downstream Oh, is it a dream? There's a fog along the horizon A strange glow in the sky Our goth uncle Bright Eyes, as chosen by Tony Brown. He's going to be with us uh, until three o'clock. If you've got any questions for him, one double six one double seven. The Nation Station, Match Radio. Women today. Uh, it is just coming up to 10 minutes to three. We've been joined on the Conister Rock this afternoon by Tony Brown, OBE, former Chief Minister of the Isle of Man. Uh, Tony, when you sent through your information to us, the list of uh, various committees you've been a member of, responsibilities you've held over the years, posts you've held. It's exhausting to read, I have to say. Everything from being on the Silverdale Car Park Committee to Chairman of Manx Heritage Foundation, economics, climate change, planning, so many different things. I'm going to be cruel now. I'm going to ask you if it's possible to pinpoint just a couple of things that you think really stand out for you as, as sort of personal achievements over the course of your career. Well, I think some of those, um, and, and it is difficult because, as you say, I was happy to be involved in so much or privileged to be. Um, I think one was social changes we made in the early 80s and, and the late 80s, which helped benefit many, many people on the island who were on very low incomes. And we were able to do that because the island became more successful um, and we were able to support people and families. Um, the development of um, Mill Street, which is where I used to live, um, which after 30 years lying derelict, I was able to play an important part in encouraging that to be redeveloped for housing. So we now have families living back in that street and it's quite an old street in the town. Um, the redevelopment of uh, Janet's Corner um, from uh, houses that were built in the 40s to what it is today, really nice area. Um, and I think the other things would be just generally, um, you know, being at the forefront of getting buildings registered in Castletown, getting Castletown as the first statutory conservation area in the Isle of Man and developing others the same. Um, I mean, there's so many, it's very difficult to say, but I mean, I was very fortunate that I, I was able to get into positions which enabled me to drive forward uh, policies that I think have benefited the island. And there'll be some, I'm sure people will say, yes, but these bits didn't. Uh, nobody's perfect, and I certainly am not. All I am is human, and all I tried to do was the best that I could for the Isle of Man. You talk about Castletown with great passion and obviously you're still very much involved in various committees mm. there. I have to ask you, what do you think of it now? It has changed quite dramatically over the past few years. It has. Uh, well, I mean, it's well known. I'm not a fan of the uh, the square. Um, I think that the decision to invest, which I support in principle, should have been made when the decision had been made to get the car parking out of the square with adequate parking close by to ensure that the businesses had people able to park close to their businesses and it could have been done with a bit more imagination and a bit more thought um, I'm not convinced that the 21st century design fits in with our Georgian buildings and I think that the modern street lights are really out of keeping uh, I think it looks lovely at night in fact to me that's when it does look nice 
um, but that's because it is lit in a way that helps that. Um, and the pr present floodworks at the harbour, some of which are necessary, um, I think has changed the character of Castletown as you come into the town. We now have massive concrete walls around our inner harbour and I just think it's spoiled what has been a nice entrance into the town. Next generation won't know any different, they'll get used to it. Um, I think there's, you know, it's important to get balances right when you're doing that sort of development and I think they've slightly gone a li little bit astray on this but that's a personal view. Well, we're not going to have time to fit in all of your songs typically because we've had such fun chatting with you and I just should say I've had a lovely message in to say uh, great to hear Tony, he's coming over so well, a real gentleman and a genuine man of the people so that's a very nice way to end it but we're going to have to nice. introduce two songs now so first of all, I'm going to ask you to introduce a song that's going to be coming up at the start of Alex's show you say you like to listen to music loudly to relax <laughs> I think it probably is the perfect song to ramp up to number 11 so what is the song that Alex is going to play for us? Well, the song he's going to play is All Right Now by Free which was 1970s and uh, it was a really big one at that time. In fact, I've got an extended version at home which goes on, I think, about 11 minutes as against the normal three and a half minutes. And when I used to DJ, it was one of the big dances that people used to enjoy. So that reminds me very much of that Good time. One. So that'll be in an Alexa show. But this one we're going to finish with is one that I had not heard before by the Moody Blues. It is a fabulous piece of music. Just introduce this for us then, Tony. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of the Moody Blues. I've got all their CDs, LPs, as they were. And uh, this one is called The Morning, Another Morning. And it's, it's really a fabulous piece of music. When people think of the Moody Blues, they tend to think of Nights in White Satin. They have so much more to them than that, and this is one of their best, I believe. Well, it's been wonderful to be on the Conister Rock with you this afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us. You will be able to watch clips and also go back and listen to the show afterwards via the Manx Radio portal. Tony Brown, OBE, former Chief Minister, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, all the best for the future. Well, thank you, Christine. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Balloons flying, children sighing, what a day to go kite flying, breezy school, away from school, cowboys fighting out at your time. Seems to stand quite still, in a child's world, it always will. Fish is biting, so exciting, lunch time sounds so inviting, and the bill, he gets a thrill, sitting, watching, popping, well, time. Seems to stand quite still in a child's world. It always will. Yesterday's dreams are tomorrow's signs. Watch children play. They seem so. In today. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all new Super Fast Plus broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds, and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high speed action with Super Fast Plus broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey, and Port Erin or click Shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.